So it's getting into that dreadful hour of Friday afternoons when I'm sure everybody would rather be um, elsewhere, at least with a different kind of beverage choice. The beverages will be available uh, at the end of all the sessions. It, it was mentioned earlier this morning, but I think it's time to highlight that now, especially because I came from the drinks industry. I think about this all day long. But beer and wine are going to be available shortly, so it's worth hanging in there for. Don't desert now. Um, Alex and Michael are going to talk to us next. And we, we want to think about this, this human connection, you know, and the, the reality that it's hard to take on board everything that we're listening to in these couple days. It's even harder to act on it. Um, but it's those human connections and that dialogue and that, that link, that spark that makes something different, that makes something come to life. And I hope you get this out of this. Um, Alex and I met last year in Mexico City at the Latin America event. I'm trying to persuade him to come to Peru. If you haven't heard me say it yet, Peru in August, Latin America. It will be a fresh expect, uh, perspective. It will be an energizing event. Uh, you'll get a lot out of it. But right now what we want to listen to is this, making that connection, making a difference, um, taking it somewhere. And at the end of the day, it's our personal reputations that make a difference in getting things through. Be it a client agency relationship or be a client within your own organization, your stakeholders. The data doesn't convince the rest of the people. The data might convince us. Oh, sorry. Um, the data might convince us, but really, people are listening to us. We're the ones that have that on our shoulders, and it's our reputations that are going to make a difference, and it's our ability to persuade and convey things clearly to people. The data is for us, not for the rest of the world. So, anyway, uh, happy to introduce Alex and Michael, and um, they're going to dazzle us. Um, I'd like you to meet uh, David and look at his sign. Nobody loves me. I walked past David uh, about a month ago and those words cut me to the bone. They really did. I was all over the place. There was I sort of on my way to work. How dare somebody get inside my head like that. I really was quite worked up for a, for a good couple of weeks. I spoke to my wife about it. I spoke to my friends about it. I even spoke to my children about it to get their perspective on this. Was this fair? So I was pleased a couple of weeks later when I was able to uh, meet David again. And this time I, uh, I went up to him and had a chat. I was intrigued by his sign, Nobody Loves Me. And it turns out David had done rigorous A-B testing with his signs. He tried signs, he tried no signs, he tried different messages. This is the one that delivered him the greatest return on investment. And I kid you not, when I was speaking to him, a kind lady came up to him and said, I'm sure that's not true. Somebody loves you and gave him five pounds. So what I'm trying to demonstrate there is the power of an emotional message and connecting on a human level. Okay, meet another David. This is David Ogilvy, um, a legend and one of the original Mad Men. David Ogilvy worked in the Manhattan office for a while and every morning on his way to work he used to walk past a homeless guy and this is the sign that that homeless guy had I'm blind, please help. Every day that David walked past this chap there was no money in his cup. You might have heard this story before. So David, you know, being a creative type, said, I wonder if I can help this chap. 
So he changed the message to give it a much more emotional punch. It's spring, I'm blind, please help. Lo and behold, the cup was full every time he walked after thereafter. Okay, um, so I'm talking really, it doesn't really, I'm talking about contexts here. So there's, there's a, a homeless guy on the street looking to connect with passers-by. So I'm on the stage and I'm looking to make a connection with you, my audience. Now, ironically, for a company that spends all day, every day, marking videos, giving them a score out of 10 for their success in getting an emotional impact, whenever we got on a stage, we would hit people with a series of rational product features. Now, that is not the way to make an emotional connection. So, going forward, when I jump up on the stage, or when anybody from Real Life jumps up on the stage, I think there's an importance to try to be less rational, more emotional, softer, less text, more pictures. So that's what I'm doing, that's my context. Here's another context where being able to uh, deliver an emotional impact is pretty important. The Super Bowl, we tested every single Super Bowl at this year, we did it in, in a couple of days. This was the five million dollars it costs to, to, for a 30 second spot. So you can't take any chances. This unfortunately was uh, an ad from Colgate. Um, it wasn't a bad ad, but it just wasn't executed so well. It actually scored the lowest out of all 72. So you can see there, the, the, the scores there where it says four, five, and five. That's our uh, emotional score. It's an overall performance score. Um, and you can see that uh, we can break this out by age group. So you can see that people over 30 are getting it, you know, there's a bit more of an emotional connection with people over 30. And that's quite useful for media distribution. But let me just explain briefly um, how that emotional score is calculated. So the first measure is attraction, and it did well in attraction. And that was how well it managed to get people's attention in the first eight seconds. Then there's retention. Okay, how well did it, you know, after that initial attention, was the attention sustained? This is where it fell off a cliff. Engagement, that's overall engagement, overall facial movement. And that's negative emotions as well as positive ones. And then there's impact as well, and that's really a measure for how the video left people feeling. Um, and we borrowed uh, the peak end rule by Daniel Kahn. Okay, here's a winner. This was a Doritos ad uh, called Ultrasound. Um, and it scored very weak. We can break it out by male and female. You can see it scored 10 for male and 10 for female. So it really was a very high performer. Often those numbers are quite different. I hope that there would be some, um, a greater delta between the numbers because that would illustrate better um, the media decisions that could be taken off the back of this. So, why is it important for advertisers and brands to make an emotional connection? Well, emotions drive behavior and decisions in human beings. And so, what we did last year, we made a lot of capital last year, 2015, um, of correlating our emotion, our emotional score, to social performance. That's human behavior. And as you can see um, along the x-axis, there's a one to 10, that's the emotional score. And you can see the trend very clearly that if you're sort of getting above uh, eight or nine or seven, above seven, you're starting to get exponential results. So that's why it's, in, you know, it, it, it's important to, to validate why we do what we do. And this was a validation piece. Now, I wanted to get on the stage and tell you about how emotions 
um, affect dry sales. They do, but I've been embargoed from talking about it. We've been working with a big FMCG company for about six months now. They've given us a lot of sales data with um, the associated ads. Now, um, we have written a white paper, and we're going to be presenting that uh, next month in Seville uh, at, a, at, a, at an exhibition, uh, a conference. Um, but right now, sadly, I'm not in a position to, to share that with you. So watch this space. You know, we'll be making a, in the same way we made the splash in 2015 with social prediction, we'll be making a splash in 2016 with sales prediction. So really, this is the central theme of my message. Good things happen when you make an emotional connection. So that can be uh, a, a homeless guy looking to maximize the generosity of passers-by. It can be me on a stage trying to get some sort of connection with you in the hope you might remember something of what I've said three o'clock on a Friday afternoon. Um, or it can be the, uh, the advertisers, that context as well. If they make a social, if they make a, an emotional connection, then good things happen in terms of people will watch and share their videos, and they might even buy the product too. Okay, so um, I now wanted to sort of talk about, um, before I pass over to, to Michael, the, the, the journey that we've been on, that Realize has been on, and facial coding more generally. We've come a long way in a short time, and I'm illustrating this with my uh, pictures of my daughter, Ella. So we were born, if you like, uh, five years ago in 2011. Um, we became toddlers uh, three years ago in 2013. This is us today. This is Ella now. I see our stage of uh, you know, the emergence, our emergence in, in this world as one of early adolescence. That's where we are now, full of promise. And I predict that in two years' time, 2018, this is where facial coding will be and it's full blue. So I'm gonna pass you over to Michael now. I'm very proud uh, to be on the stage with Michael because we, uh, we've done a, recently done a, 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 a collaboration, a partnership with them, um, and that's made a big impact to our business and to the industry, and that's why um, I'm delighted to share the stage this afternoon with Michael. So over to you, mate. Hi everyone. Um, so as Alex mentioned, my name is Michael Adenby and I work at Mediacom in the uh, Central Insights team. Um, for those of you who may or may not know much about Mediacom as an agency, uh, a year or two ago we switched our position from trying to be a, a traditional communications agency and instead position ourselves as the content and connections agency. Mm. Now the connections part is relatively easy for us because that's involving a lot of understanding about how campaigns and communication works and we've done that for a long time. The content element though, was something that was, although we were working on it and had been getting into that space, uh, I think we needed to, to be developing a little bit more on. Um, so actually, the first point here is about why video. And we have lots of various different stats here, if they play. Here we go. Um, as to the power of video. So we know the video is itself very powerful and you know it can help push your communication, it can help resonate with an audience. And the big one they were highlighting is we've seen stats and other other research that suggests it can create a really strong emotional connection with an audience, with a, with a, with a customer. Well, I want to do a bit of a throwback. It's not Thursday today, but uh, here we have a, a throwback to uh, an old communications framework at Mediacom. So I, I joined Mediacom uh, about nine years ago, um, and at the time, this was the way that we sort of approached our thinking around communications. Uh, and it fell into sort of one of three tasks. What were we trying to communicate with that campaign, with that message? Was it a rational, a sort of head message? An emotional, a more heart message? Or was it about actually trying to get people to buy more directly, which was the, the, the hand message? And actually, when I started working with Alex and have realized, actually I saw that we could apply this same framework, even though we'd moved on as Mediacom beyond it, um, into how we understand content generally. I mean, it's been you know, long established, you can ask people questions around ads and now content as well to get a rational understanding. 
and we know that you can understand after the event how well, or while, whilst things are live, we understand how well they're performing. But now we've realized this gave us an opportunity to say, actually, how emotionally engaging, is it resonating with the audience on that kind of level? Um, so what we've been working with over the last 18 months, couple of years, with, with Realize and ourselves, is really looking to understand and, and use them to strengthen our content understanding. So they feed into this, this uh, first stage here about the emotional response, and we can get a lot of data from their platform. If we incorporate those emotional tests into fairly standard quantitative surveys, we can get the claimed rational responses to it as well. And then beyond that, once content has been placed online, or if it's the previous campaign, there's going to be a lot of social performance available, both for that content, that campaign, but also then we can start to build up benchmarks to understand, okay, how well did that compare to previous things we've done, and how can we understand or help that to forecast uh, what we're going to be doing in the future. And these four elements have been tying into a product that we're calling the Content Assessment Tool. Um, that leads to a nice shorthand of CAT. We know that CAT videos can perform well on the internet, so there's a nice little tie in there as well. We don't actually get cats to watch videos, though, so some people are getting confused. So I want to give a couple of examples of how we've been using CAT and our, and our uh, association with Realize for some of our clients. We know that there are big benefits to running global content uh, approaches, but actually, and we've been able to prove this, we've realized there can be some big differences in how different markets respond to the same piece of content. So this was an example of one of our clients, Sony Mobile. Uh, we ran a piece of their video content, and this was the emotional response curve at, a, at an aggregated level across four markets. But then we can split out the different reactions by markets. So we have the UK, so this is percentage variance against that average. Uh, then Mexico, uh, France, and lastly, Indonesia. And you can see actually at different points across the course of the video, there are some quite big differences. In the middle section, you can see a big, big peak for Indonesia and also for the UK. But at that point, in the same content piece, there was a, sort of an, a lower reaction or underscoring uh, from Mexico and from France. And then towards the end, when we started to show the actual product in hand, yeah, so it was, a, it was a Sony Mobile, so we were showing the phone, you could see that the resonant uh, the engagement with the content was again higher in Indonesia and also a bit higher in France. So from this we can say this long piece of content was about 1 minute 20. If you're going to start cutting it down maybe to distribute in, in smaller, shorter formats, there'll be some parts that seem to resonate particularly well in some markets. So you might want to focus on that and distribute it to them. Likewise, we could say, well, what will we be saying in those different sections? And when we produce future content, we can try and communicate a similar message because it really seems to resonate with that, kind of, with that market. For those of you who may be avid media comm watchers, you might have heard of some of our news recently that we've been partnering with the Hofstede Institute. Uh, and well, that's, that's all focusing on different markets um, understanding. And we're hoping to incorporate some of that work with what we're doing with Realize as well. So I think we're looking to build on this because there definitely seems to be interesting ways that we can approach um, you know, multi-market work for some of our bigger clients. Lastly, and sorry, I'll just be quick here. Um, some of you may be able to guess what this is, um, but for those of you who need a bit of help, Coca-Cola are one of our big clients. We work with in lots of different markets. And actually, in many cases, they are a perfect choice for emotional content testing uh, because everything they do is communicating around sharing happiness. And happiness is one of the metrics that we can cover with Realize. So again, we tested the same content here in three different markets, Germany, Spain, and Great Britain. And it scored a six out of 10 at a total level, which was pretty good. But actually, there were differences in terms of each market. And here we can say that for this video, it seems to work hardest in the UK of the three. So let's deep dive into that. As Alex mentioned, we can cut the data by different metrics. So it scores a seven out of 10 at total in the UK. But if we split that by men or women, actually it works harder for women in the UK. There was about a 10% difference there at an average level. Okay, then beyond that, if we know it works harder for women in the UK, um, then we can cut that even further and say for younger women, it seems to be resonating this, this concept of happiness the most. So for that one video that we tested just in three markets, we can then drill all the way down to saying, this is the market and this is the audience in that market where the content seems to resonate and therefore could potentially work the hardest for us. And of course, this has implications in terms of targeting and distribution, in terms of how we can say, well, this seems to work best with our audience. Maybe we should push a bit more of our investment to getting in front of those people. And just to wrap up from MediaCom perspective, this is really how we're thinking about the emotional testing and CAT as a, as a tool, as a product for our clients. And there are five key areas really that we think there are strong implications for our clients. 
Um, I mean, you can see them all here, but basically, I think it's going right from the race start, the content creation, the ideation point, all the way through to once you have a final version, how you distribute it or how you target it. And we can test this content throughout the process with Realize, and we can see actually how does this feed into our understanding of the content and the audience we're trying to communicate with? Is it pushing the right messages, and therefore, is it going to be successful? Thank you. Questions for Michael and Alex? This, this emotional and human connection, I think, is really important. Um, not just the man on the street with the sign and research working at its simplest form of calibrating what works by the money that gets dropped, or looking at happiness and some of these other metrics. But as I was saying before, this human connection also makes a really different really big difference in how we can convey our, our point of view. Uh, one of the most interesting challenges that I had from the client side was when I had an uh, overwhelming data set that said go with the decision at hand. Go, go, go. All the action standards were met by leaps and bounds, consistent across the board, never th seen anything as clear. And my internal stakeholders were scared to death to make the change because it was big and it was scary, and it was 35 years of positive growth that they did not want to screw up. But they trusted me, and that connection had been built over a long time. And they came back and they said, it was painful, but we made the change, and we had our best quarter ever. So thank you, because we wouldn't have done that without your input. So think about these emotional connections. This human stuff really makes a difference. The data points didn't convince them. It was the power of our connection. So if you take away anything from today, think about that. Think about all the challenges and think about making all of those great opportunities to grow our business. And now it's break time. So everybody's got 20 minutes to hang out in, in the networking hall. And um, next session starts at in 20 minutes. I don't even know what time zone I'm in. In 20 minutes, the next session starts. Thanks, everybody.